Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive functions. This show is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. These conversations will introduce mental tools that will empower you to shift your mindset for a successful life. And now, here's your host, Sucheta Kamath. All right, welcome back to Full Prefrontal, where we are exposing the mysteries of executive function. As always, I am here with our host, Sucheta Kamath. Good morning, my friend. This is going to be a fun conversation. I know you guys are old friends. Yes, it's going to be so great. And it's great to be with you, Todd. And, you know, today I was thinking about as I got ready for this conversation, you know, as a speech and language pathologist, when I did my undergrad or ma- and master's, we never had any type of training to deal with difficulties that we might have with patients or clients. But I know I have talked to a lot of my colleagues who are psychologists and psychiatrists, and they themselves go through some therapy for themselves. And I have always found this very, very fascinating concept. Because teachers, speech language pathologists, counselors, we are all in the business of helping people. But we often think that because we are helping, we have to really stay away from their pushback or their difficulties or them blaming the clinician, for example, for the root of their problems. So in that context, friendships have really been very, very important. And, you know, it's always a fantastic thing to have a psychiatrist as a friend because, you know, you can just literally get cheap therapy. <laughs> but the second thing that's really important to me and Todd, you and I have talked about this on this podcast is I have a, a very deep spiritual life and I am a practitioner. I totally believe in introspection and spirituality to means is to not just finding meaning, but also connecting with every person with great intention. And that's what is most, so exciting to me about this conversation that I'm about to have with a very dear friend. And finally, I'll say this, that each person, I highly recommend that we should have a street committee, uh, a group of consultants that are on standby that we should look for, reach out to, who will give you advice, who will anchor you, and who will always feel comfortable saying, uh, no, you're being stupid. <laughs> so this dear friend is that. So it gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce my very dear friend. And his name is officially pronounced Suvrat Bhargave, but I think he also is fondly known as Dr. B. He is a renowned and respected educator, author, speaker, and a board-certified psychiatrist who specializes in child and adolescent psychiatry. He, his uncanny ability to relate to a multi-demographic audience has allowed his practice to reach an unparalleled level of success based on empathy, education, and empowerment. And I cannot speak enough about his tender heart and deep compassion for every person that's sitting in front of him. His book, A Moment of Insight, which I am very excited that we'll talk a lot about that, Universal Lessons Learned from a Psychiatrist's Couch, offer practical strategies and thought-provoking narratives to not only understand and preserve through challenging dilemmas, but to see greater purpose during these times. He demonstrates this through poignant patient stories and personal accounts. Another a few things about him is he's a passionate advocate for healing and empowerment. He is here to offer a message of hope to his patients and the world. And he really believes in changing each person one moment at a time. And of course, we will link up how to get in touch with him, but you can find more about him and invite him to speak at your next event. He is a superstar when he when it comes to talking to parents and educators. So you should visit his website, which is called drpargave.com. So welcome to the show. And by the way, for this interview, I'm going to call him Suvi. I hope you don't mind. Welcome. No, thank you so much for having me. And I'm going to just go ahead and say it. I'm going to call you Suchi as well, because that's who my friend is. And I'll tell you, it's an interesting thing to listen to your friend talk about you and the way that you just did. It it reminds me how many layers there are to our relationship. And I'll also say this, when it comes to that street posse that we all need, that person who will really always be there and sometimes call you out on your stuff, you are so that for me. So uh, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to be here. And just a quick anecdote to our listeners. We are really revealing ourselves now. But Suvi and I... (laughs) When Oprah retired from her official show, (laughs) so he and I, we go long, long ways. We have done a talk show together, a radio talk show. And, you know, he has a secret life as a host of many types of shows, but he also has a radio show that's currently going on. 
And so we actually applied, right, to be in that uh, reality show to become the hosts. Right. right. I, I can't believe you're going there, but you sure. Let's go there. Yeah, we did. <laughs> we, 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 we had uh, some notion in our head that uh, somehow Oprah was going to agree to to do two shows instead of one and put both of us on the air and, and we would both have our dreams <laughs> realized. <laughs> so. Well, I'm really rooting for you to get on her show and I get to tell friends that that's Subi. I know him. Well, welcome to the show. And I always ask my guests about, uh, since this show is about executive function, which is, a, you know, your self-administrative skills, how do we uh, stay goal-oriented, manage our behavior and emotions and attitudes as we are trying to achieve goals that we have set out for ourselves. And if we don't have the wisdom to have those goals for us, then have the wisdom to follow somebody who is, says these goals are important to you. So in that context, would you tell us a little bit about your own executive function and when or what did you discover about yourself as a learner and a thinker? You know, it's, a, it's such a great question that we should all probably ponder. At what point did we really become or really value our learning? And even as I hear you say that, in my head, I'm thinking back to a time when I wasn't learning or actively processing and trying to figure things out. And, you know, I say in the book and describe myself as having been a child with anxiety. And the other word for anxiety is doubt. It's the disease of doubt. And so questioning was such a part of my life for as long as I can remember. I don't know when I wasn't questioning the world around me. And I, I viewed it for the first part of my life as a disadvantage. I, you know, I used to look at my peers my age and I would think to myself, what is it like to not think this much? Or what would it be like to not question this much? So it's hard for me to remember a time when I wasn't questioning and conditioning myself to collect data and make it make sense. And so in terms of you know, my executive functioning, I would say early childhood. Early childhood is when I first really became aware. What, what I didn't really do as well at that point was, I don't know that I observed my thoughts, which, you know, I'm sure we'll get into later, but in terms of the actual exploration and recognition of a voice within me that was trying to piecemeal and put the world together at very early age, very early. Thank you for drawing a distinction between these two things, which is so interesting and, and knowing you and we have talked about learning and in your book, you write about this as well. But having a deep understanding that people have thoughts, ideas, beliefs and becoming aware, of how do they parallel your own thoughts, ideas and beliefs is a very important social, psychological, emotional development. But to think about your own thinking and then kind of ponder and redirect is a, a whole you know gamut of metacognition. So that of course, it's, it's a, a painful process mm -hmm. uh, because then you also discover some other flaws that your, your thinking possesses or your behaviors have. Mm -hmm. So so let's start talking about your work. You know, you, you see patients in your practice who are struggling and we might even call it suffering. But the simple experience of ongoing discomfort or misery does not propel people to make changes to their lives. How can suffering be a vehicle to move oneself forward? Yeah. You know, the title of the book, A Moment of Insight, to me, is the piece that is important in terms of where do you finally turn it around or have a chance to turn it around and start to make a difference. So suffering in and of itself, I think sometimes you can find yourself actually getting stuck in it. Uh, and so the idea of moving forward requires something more than suffering. And every one of us has suffered. We've all at some point felt victimized, had things that were not in our control that either happened to us or, or caused us to feel certain mm. things or, or go through that. So I think the crucial moment is, is that moment of insight. And that moment of insight that I talk about in the book is where you do have the awareness. So it kind of goes back to what you just said about the, you know, the difference in the two. It, it's when you do have a second of awareness. It's where you do observe for one second your own perceptions and realize that a certain way of thinking or feeling or behaving, whatever it is in that moment, that it isn't working for you. So you can go through the motions and still not have that, that realization. But as soon as you can look in on yourself and say, wow, this way of thinking or feeling or behaving is, is not working for me, then you can start to make change happen. So hmm. one of the amazing things about being a psychiatrist is that I get to witness that. I get to witness that in front of my eyes. And for some people, it's something that I might have said that God got them to pause. Sometimes it's something that came out of their own mouth, but they hadn't really stopped to hear it. And that made them pause. But whatever it is, I've gotten to witness it over and over again. And, and it's really interesting. So sometimes it's uh, just a tilt of the head that lets me know that a shift 
just happened. So <laughs> yes. sometimes it is, you know, the person actually says out loud, wow, I hadn't thought of that. But in whatever way it presents itself, that's the piece that I find very exciting for the person sitting with me, because I know that that has the potential now for there to be a change and a way of getting out of the suffering if you can just be on the outside and see it. You know, you surprised me when uh, when I got the pre-publishing copy of your book. In so many ways, you're, you're a unique in your practice and your approach to psychiatry. You don't have a, 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 a you're a rare breed of psychiatrist who actually does do some individual work with their, uh, uh, other than just a medication, which is such a joy for me. But you also are somebody who actually, as you said, watch that journey uh, long enough that the transformations are visible to you and then you make those them visible to them. So, you know, that brings me to this idea that of all psychiatric ailments that I see in my patients who have executive function challenges, anxiety seems to take the crowning glory. You know, you say in your book, I quote, for most, uh, for, for most anxiety is all of these things feeling tense, worried, fearful, pressured, panicked, inadequate, and obsessive. And I just love that you summarized everything mm-hmm. that my patients feel. A person who is highly dysregulated, perpetually scattered, late and disorganized, seemingly callous, uncertain about goals, often is accused of being disengaged and incompetent. For this person, anxiety is just simple byproduct of having executive dysfunction. They may even appear like swan uh, in a lake, but calm on the outside, but massive unrest inside. So talk a little bit about anxiety and how do we think about anxiety. And you write beautifully about this. There's so much hope for people who feel anxious and, and, and not having anxiety is literally not being a human. So where's the balance? (laughs) Right, right. No, that's, that's a good point. It's worth saying that from the beginning of any discussion about anxiety is that on uh, anxiety is within the range of human experience and, and human emotion. So there is no one listening right now who hasn't had moments of anxiety. But for those of us who identified ourselves as having been anxious people or might still suffer with anxiety, it is more intense than you would imagine it ought to be. It, it, it lasts longer in your reactions than you would imagine it should. It, it, it happens frequently in your life where you find yourself doubting. So I think people who are anxious on some level do know that there's something about the way that they respond that is greater than it should be for them or, or in some ways getting in the way of how it should be. But I don't think most people know to call it anxiety. I can say that I didn't, you know, that word, I wish that word had been introduced into my vocabulary at a younger point in my life, because I might have then recognized it as something other than my own deeper self telling me that I have reason to doubt myself and everything around me. But if you can see it as a phenomenon, as its own force, then you have a chance of not internalizing it and responding to it in a way that we think is instinctive right? It's almost like anxiety now walked in the door and it's up to me to recognize when it walked into the room. So I always tell people that when when I'm hoping to educate others about what anxiety is, whatever word makes sense to you, but I do want you to know that it can look differently at different times. So for some, it means being tense and on edge. And for others, it means being excessively worried. And for some, it means mm. being fearful. And for others, it means a sense of, of dread. And for others, it means being obsessive. But it's all still anxiety. And, and anxiety being the insidious force that it is, it'll come at you a different way just when you figured it out one way. So then it, it'll come at you another way. Thank you for clarifying that. And I think if I can ask you to uh, tell us a little bit more about this idea that aren't emotions showing up they, uh, to get us to act. So what is anxiety telling you to do? And how can one interpret that in the right way? And as you said, anything with excess is when did the disorder, you know, regular human experience expands into a range of disability, right? Yes, absolutely. It's in such a great way to make that distinction because you're right, up to a point, anxiety serves a purpose, right? I mean, I always say anxiety got me through medical school. So a little bit of a nudge to, oh my goodness, I need to study a test <laughs> coming up causes me to act. And that's the thing, you know, anxiety when it shows itself in, in, into our, our space and, and we feel it, our body does react. And most of us have heard this phrase, you know, you, you fight or you flee, right? You fight or flight response. And it's meant to do that. It is meant to cause us to act. So again, if I have a test, I should act, I should study. If I'm about to cross the street, I should look both ways. If I'm walking down a path, 
I should be on the lookout for a bear that might pop out of the woods. You know, that type of thing, if that's such a thing. So it, <laughs> it, it, is, it is a system that is meant to serve a function. The problem for people who have anxiety is that we often experience that alarm system in a very false way. So the way I explain it to young children is it's a false alarm that makes you think that there really is something right now in this moment that is happening that you need to respond to and in some way prepare for, in other words, fight or flee, when there really isn't. So for young kids, the way that I explain that is, again, if you're if I'm about to cross the street, everyone understands I should look both yeah. ways. The alarm goes off, right? But if I am walking in a wide open field, a wide open pasture, and the alarm goes off, anxious people start looking. We start looking and then we start rationalizing. We bring emotion into our thinking and we start rationalizing and we do start running with the what ifs. And look, I can make any situation seem like there is imminent danger. I can tell myself that there are big tractors that actually do come on open fields and I, it could have been here and I might have missed it and it might have come over me. Or I can remind myself that even though it feels the exact same as what I've come to understand as an alarm, this one's a false alarm. There really isn't anything happening right now in this moment. And that's very hard. I mean, in, in my example, it doesn't sound so hard. But when you've felt the presence of anxiety in your life from the really from the moment that you really had conscious awareness of your thinking, you develop a habit of responding to it. And I think that's what anxious people have a hard time then flowing against that pattern of, of one what if leading to another what if leading to another what if and preparation for something that's about to happen or the idea that I'm not good enough. And then, you know, you take that small thread and you unravel it to the point where I can't do anything right. So for, yeah. for many of us, I think that just became a habit. I think the very important distinction that you drew for us is that one is it's incessant and it's not directly proportionate to the pre precipitating factor and it, it, it lingers longer than it should. Yes. And the, more importantly, as you see, particularly with the kids that you and I serve, that there is a reason for them to be anxious. They are disorganized. So if they begin to panic that, oh, my God, I haven't studied or I don't have a book. They have a legit reason. So it's not that they are even making it up, but just because somebody's anxious, they will not take the right steps. And that's where there's a disconnect that anxiety doesn't serve and doesn't end in itself. And, yeah. and that's why I think your message is so clear about whoever is helping the children need to kind of, and I don't know if the parents can do that, but who can really do the job of pointing out that the, the fear is irrational or the worry is unreasonable because you can't tell an anxious person that, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> not, not right away anyway. I mean, I think eventually it is the goal for uh, anyone who's dealing with anxiety to be able to coach themselves into asking, you know, is this a real alarm or a false alarm? But yeah, I think the adults in the life of young people, those who are involved in, in taking care of and guiding young people, so that could be a teacher and certainly the parents or anyone can serve that function. And so what I ask parents to do in that situation is, if you see that your child is panicking and you're trying to help them distinguish, then there's two questions that will help you really kind of sort it out. The first question is, is there something happening right now? Is there something in this moment that you are responding right. to that's happening right now, right? Because if there is, again, we, we probably need to act. If the child comes into your room and says, I had a bad dream, someone's going to break in the house and take me. Well, is there something happening right now? Because anxiety would have us anticipate and what if and, and, and you know, prepare for the future or perhaps even ruminate over the past. But yes. if there's something not happening right now, then it's chances are it's a false alarm. And then the follow up question to that would be, is there something more to do about it right now? And Wait, that, right. And that yeah. follow up question really came to me from a, a young girl that I saw in my practice many, many years ago who was actually having what I could tell in that moment in the session was a panic attack. And I said to her, well, let's, let's practice this. You know, is there something happening right now? Fully expecting that she was going to say no, because it was just us sitting in the room. And to my surprise, she said yes. And I said, well, what's happening right now? And she said, well, my <laughs> teacher's husband is in the hospital right now, and he's very sick. And what if something happens to him? So the follow-up question of, is there something more we can do about that right now? kind of came in as, as a secondary question. But again, it helps you distinguish a real alarm from a false alarm. Because anxious people would like to think that they can control every variable or if they work even harder than exactly. in some way, right? Yes. That in some way it's <laughs> going to be different and, and you're taking on something that is not yours to take on. And that's what anxiety does. It, it makes you want to do 110%. And you can't do 110%. You can do 100%. You can do what's <laughs> within yours to control. And then after that, you have to surrender the outcome. 
Um, and of course, the wisdom is that you don't even know how to do 100%, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Anxious people who are trying to do 110% don't need to know that even 100% is very difficult. Uh, <laughs> but, but you know, when I say give it 100%, anxious people think that they are perfectionistic sure. people, because like, that's another word for anxiety, think that they're settling. And I have to remind them 100%, you know, even from what I remember about math, that's the whole pie, right? That's, that's it. That's, that's all you can do. <laughs> so you're not settling. You're, you're doing your best. That's lovely. So one of my favorite things about your work and your writing is that you are a physician and a practitioner, but you do not shy away from talking about the intersection between psychiatry and spirituality, where both call upon this idea of self-discovery and self-surrender. They both help gain a sense of agency and build meaning and let go when necessary, particularly in unfavorable circumstances. So talk to me about this intersection. You do write that in your book, that one place the psychiatry and spirituality intersect is the notion that with the heaviest burdens, there is no place on in one's life for shame. So I would love for you to explore that a little bit with us. Yeah, I know. I would love to do that. So and going back for a second to our friendship, I think it's really interesting as, as I think about, you know, how everything in life serves a purpose. You know, you and I became friends many, many years ago. Uh, who would have thought that we would have such wonderful, deep spiritual discussions, but it has been a common thread for our relationship yeah. as well. I also similarly had never expected that psychiatry would be a forum for me to have spiritual understanding. You know, you think of psychiatry as being a field of medicine that is related to our thinking and our feeling, but it's much more than that. It really is tied to spirit. And all of these struggles that come about from psychiatric illness, I believe are also a way, a, a possibility, a conduit to be able to really start exploring, well, why do these things happen at all, right? And, and who am I when these things keep happening? And how can I maintain some sense of, of consistency in my life, even when life is going up and down and up and down and up and down? So I found that in having really deep discussions with people at their toughest times, we would actually start asking those questions. And the beautiful thing about asking questions many times over and over again, in as many discussions as, I, as I've been able to have in 20 years, is you ask enough questions, you know, ultimately you find some answers. So psychiatry revealed some really great answers. So I think in terms yes. <laughs> of, yeah, I think in terms of the spiritual cross-section between psychiatry and spirituality, the very first place where it shows up time and time again and session after session is that concept of shame that you talk about or that you were referring to in my book as well. That you talked about, my dear. That friend. I talked about, <laughs> yes, that I talked about. Shame is such a common piece of baggage that everyone brings into the sessions that I have as a psychiatrist, whether it's the shame of having to come in to see me, or it is the shame of what they are feeling, or it's the shame of what they have gone through, or it is the shame of what they themselves have done. This idea that in some way I am not good enough because of what I have thought or done or felt is to me the biggest part of treatment. If we don't tackle shame, there's no room for hope. Wow. Um, yes. After I read, as I was preparing, this is my third time reading your book. And on the way back, I was listening to Conan O'Brien's podcast mm -hmm. and David Letterman came on the show and they both were talking and I, I, to spare everybody from complex talk show history, but it was so interesting that David Letterman was talking about shame or sense of inadequacy he, he experienced taking on after jo uh, Johnny Carson. And uh, Conan O'Brien was talking about shame and sense of inadequacy he felt and continues to feel. He was, I could, I could hear mm -hmm. that he was getting choked up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, now, 20 years down, uh, like later when he's so successful about not, because he was uh, for a year, they kept telling him they were going to fire him. And as I was listening, I was just thinking about this conversation we were about to have that what does it take? Like, what are the signs of success you need to not feel shame? And apparently... It's not dependent on anything outside. That's right. That's right. That's the high five moment. If you were sitting here right now, that's where, you know, we would high five. Because I think ultimately we all come to that conclusion that at some point to understand and, and, to, and to tackle shame means we have to take the conversation out of what it is that I'm doing or what role it is that I'm playing. Whereas we've been conditioned to think, I think from a very young age, that what you do is what defines who you are and that the two are intertwined. And I challenge people to actually do the exact opposite, separate the two completely. What you do is not who you are. What you feel is not who you are. Uh, I love and, that. And, and the difference between guilt and shame 
because people mix those two together, just like we mix who I am with what I do. Guilt is regret for what I've done, but shame is remorse for who I am. Wow. Say that again. Sorry. Say that again. Yeah. Yeah. Guilt is, is regret for what I've done, but shame is remorse for who I am. And what people do is they take guilt and they convert it into shame. And look, I've learned as an, as an anxious temperament child, and I've learned as someone who gets to sit with people all day long who deal with anxiety, that guilt is kind of the go-to emotion for anxious people. We're just waiting to jump to guilt. We, we sort of, it's our go-to that we, that we hate, but we somehow <laughs> train ourselves to, to feel guilty about things. There is one purpose of guilt. The one purpose of guilt is to teach you. So if you ever feel guilty, stop and ask yourself, you know, what should I have? Could I have, or should I be doing differently? And then really learn it, right? Really learn yes. it <laughs> and, and make amends if you need to. And then finally, the most important part about guilt is release it. Say thank you to it and release it. But people hold on to guilt or they feel guilt when there was nothing to learn and it becomes shame. And shame is so much heavier. This idea that that what I have done now results in me not being good enough. I don't know very many people who haven't struggled with shame at some point in their lives. And the most successful people perhaps struggle with it the most because they may, they may feel like as soon as they stop doing what it is other people want them to do, now suddenly their sense of self goes way down. So I'm not surprised to hear someone as famous as Conan O'Brien would still <laughs> uh, still suffer. I, I think until you until you define who you are that has nothing to do with what you do and no role that you play, it will continue to, to hurt you. And I think one thing that I picked up from you is this idea that guilt is there to teach you something learn from it and let it go. And guilt, as I read from literature, talks about is a moral emotion that says you didn't do what you were supposed to do. So as long as you frame it that way and say, oh, wait, I didn't do it. So maybe I was supposed to wish my mother on her birthday and I forgot. Oh, how bad, my bad. But yeah. so guilt is to you never call her because now you're feeling shame that I'm a horrible son or daughter. That's right. That's <laughs> right. That's exactly it. So, the, you know, the guilt part of it was the piece that was supposed to say you did do something you shouldn't have done. And look, we've all done. I've done at least three things today I probably should not have done. And I hope that I feel guilty about it and hope that I learn from it. And hopefully I'll, I'll make amends and I'll move on. But if every time I did something wrong or felt something that was bad, if I thought that was a reflection of who I really am, then you can see why making a mistake would carry such a heavier weight than it really needs to. So for me, I can say that as a child who felt like I had, I kept making mistakes and then, you know, things, I had my life that were, that were done to me. I mean, every experience in my life seemed to, in my head as an anxious person, indicate that I wasn't good enough. So at some point I had to, just like all my patients have to, and, and the listeners will certainly understand this too. At some point you have to tackle that. You cannot yes. go through life fooling yourself that as long as I do good, <laughs> that I'm going to be fine because there's no one who can perpetually do good things all the time. And, yes. we, <laughs> and yet we need a sense of ourself that is constant. We need to know yes. that no matter what happens today, I will still be innately worthy and good and lovable. And if you do have that, well, then, you know, bring life on. Life is just life. But if you don't have that sense of who you are, then it is up and down. You know, uh, if you just saw me here, I'm sitting here speechless and nodding my head vigorously. <laughs> I hope I don't <laughs> knock the microphone off. But yes, I think that's why this message is so powerful that the change should be not yielded or desired because there's something wrong with you, because that's what the people on this earth do. We are here to make changes because change is a greater sense of attainment and the only attainment. I mean, I always like to frame it for my patients and clients that the, the by making changes in you, you're making an environment around you a better place for people to be in. And that's the gift. Like, So you don't need to go to a store and buy a gift. Just the fact that you change, that's a gift. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's a wonderful reframe, right? I mean, because again, we tend to view making these mistakes as, as such a heavy negative burden. But you're exactly right. I mean, anything that allows for us to evolve is a gift to ourselves as it is to the people in our lives. It's exactly Yeah. So, so what we know about executive function is, is that uh, it's a set of skills that help us organize our ideas, guide our emotions so that we can take better decisions and make good choices. So how do psychiatric conditions complicate the self-regulation and interfere with the decision-making and problem-solving, which is so essential for self-management? 
Well, whether it's depression or it's anxiety or really any of the conditions that I get to see in my office, it, it'll definitely throw your thinking off when you're feeling a certain way, right? So we, we tend to feel something and then think something and then act on it. And so our feelings of sadness or irritability or anxiety ultimately is going to affect our, our thinking process, which you are much more the expert on than I am. But I can tell you that as someone who's an expert on feeling, feeling always results in thinking that is in some way skewed. And thinking yes. that <laughs> skewed will then result in behaviors that will ultimately not be in your best interest, perhaps. So I think one leads to the other and they just siphon into the other. You know, what it does is it changes the inner dialogue, you know, the self-directed talk that we often use as a tool to guide and self-regulate that becomes quite skewed, as you mentioned, and becomes tainted. It, it, you become your the worst, you know, uh, sour mouth <laughs> yeah. uh, friend who's always annoyed uh, that you have to do it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. There, there's, you know, there's a couple of uh, exercises I describe in the book about how even for myself, I had to, I had to turn around. Uh, once I realized that the dialogue wasn't serving me, the dialogue in my head, I had, to, I had to find a way to change it. And so the five gifts was a way of doing that. But also one of the other things that I did for myself, and this really changed my life, is what I call the uh, kind of the reverse golden rule. So, you know, do unto others as you would have them done to you is the, is the rule. But my rule became I would only do unto myself as I would do unto others. So as someone who had a lot wait, of... Wait, back up. So talk yeah. about both of these things. These are so valuable. So can yeah. we backtrack and talk about five gifts first? Or you can talk about reverse golden rule. Because 90% of the kids that I work with or in adults I work with, with executive function, they're, they're famously unkind to themselves. Right. Uh, right. And they, their years of um, hardship and difficulties in not yielding the desirable goals and never feeling fully self-actualized, they often are framing their entire life that I am no good and nothing I touch is worthy. So yeah. talk, talk us uh, through that very yes. quickly, if you don't so, mind. So, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I would love to. I, I'll come back to the five gifts. I think that the reverse golden rule to me, when I say that it changed my life, I, I, that's not meant to be dramatic. It really, really changed my life. I recognized in doing the exercise of the five gifts that one of my gifts, which I'll talk about in a second, was is empathy. I know I have empathy. And even back then when I was my most insecure self, I couldn't deny that I had empathy. I could understand how other people felt. And so as someone who had a great deal of empathy, you know, I, I was and am a tremendous friend because empathy lends itself to good friendship, right? If, I'm, if I can understand how you feel, I can relate more to you. And what I realized was that as a good friend, there were things that if someone came up to me at a difficult time that I would say truthfully to them to help them to feel better and see things differently, which is why people would come to me over and over again. So even before I became trained to be a psychiatrist, I was listening to people's problems because my friends were would come up to me and, and be vulnerable and talk to me. But what I realized was that in my head, I would say things to myself that I would never say to someone in that same scenario. If someone came up to me in a time of, of feeling overwhelmed, I would never say the things to them that I did to myself. I somehow took pride in being my own worst critic. And that's a terrible thing. I tell kids now, you should only ever be your own worst critic if you're also going to be your own best supporter. Yes. So if you, can, if you can do the balance of that, then fine. But otherwise, really, to be your own worst critic is not a good thing. So I charged myself at a point in my life that if I wouldn't say it out loud, I can't say it in my head. And I was so surprised how often I would catch myself about to say something else to myself that I would never say out loud. And then I would stop myself and say, well, then you can't say it. Stop. You can't. You can't say it. <laughs> and what I came to realize was that the most abusive relationship I had in my life was the one I had with my own inner self and that that had to change, that, I, wow. that it was taking a toll, that I was feeling empty and my soul was trying to tell me something has to change. That was my moment of insight. Something has to change. So the reverse golden rule became my way of, of catching it and then trying to stop the pattern. And, and it did that, it did do that for me. So that was powerful. Wow. Very, very powerful. I, I, I can maybe translate that uh, the way I'm thinking for myself. Like I, I had a friend who was a psychologist and he used to say every day you get up and you're standing for election and you have to go canvassing to get every single vote. So mm -hmm. part of what you need is you need a, a, a PR manager. So if you're going to carry your worst critic with you, then take your PR manager too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. 
There you go. I needed a good PR manager for the first half of my life. I, 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 did, I didn't even know I was missing that person in my life, but I was. I was missing it for the first half of my life. And I think that's what happened is that because I didn't have that balance, the weight of walking around the world, top heavy, if you will, with thoughts that were only about what I wasn't doing well, only noticing the things that weren't going right in my life is why it finally all hit a wall around the age of 20. And I finally realized I've got to change this. Because if I don't change this, I can't keep going. I can't keep going the way that it is right now. It has to change. And What's so, so remarkable about you, though, is so much wisdom at a very young age, and you were able to direct that to bring on change that was meaningful and sustainable. Many people don't have that. Either they don't have the wisdom or they are so engulfed by pain. I like to use this analogy as I was reading this book that what you're asking people to do is really admire a single snowflake. But when they're facing the avalanche, they have no respect or regard for the snowflake. Mm. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, totally. And, and I appreciate you saying that. I, I would like to, you know, I, I, I've thought about that sometimes. I've wondered kind of even the idea of the five gifts, which came in that moment. I don't know where that came from exactly. So, gee, I, I, I give full credit to soulful experiences that are beyond what I really understand is my human capacity. So I think there is more within each of us than we ever really realized. And I'm just glad that in moments that I needed it, that that came forward, number one. And number two, I think that it was such a desperate point in my life that I, I really thought it has to change this. I can't, I physically cannot keep going the way that I was thinking to myself. And so in that really, really low point of walking around the world for the first 20 years, and in a way that I'd again describe as top heavy, I finally realized I've got to find a way to see myself and my own life in some other way besides what I was doing. And so this five gifts exercise kind of popped into my headspace. And, and I, it's interesting to me now, I can look back on it and it was so clear. I knew exactly what it was that I was asking myself to do. And what I was asking myself to do was to actually write down my five gifts, the qualities and traits about me that I could not deny. So again, at the worst point of my life, when I was my own worst critic and could tell you 20 of my faults, I needed to now write down five traits that I just couldn't deny were my gifts. Wow. And I remember even as I gave myself that uh, task, that the, the chatter that responded to that was, oh gosh, it's so egotistical to sit around and think about your strengths, which again was, I think, the critic's way of trying to pull back, <laughs> right? No, yes. no, no, you can't go there. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're staying here. But it was so clear that that's what I needed to do, write down my five gifts. And I even gave myself a 10-day deadline. And I said, by the following Sunday, wow. you have to write down your five gifts. And I don't know where five came from. I don't know where 10 came from. I think what it was is I thought if I don't give myself a deadline, I knew me enough to know I probably wouldn't do it. And even an anxious rule follower will follow his own rules. So I did <laughs> give myself that rule. And I think five gifts felt like it was something that wasn't too easy for me. Because again, my own worst critic thought if you do two gifts, that's anyone can do that. And yet it wasn't so impossible. So I did that. And if you've never done this task, I would really encourage listeners to do it because it was, again, in no dramatic term, it was life-changing. And it took all 10 days, by the way, for me. I thought I would <laughs> so plenty of time. But I remember Sunday night telling my roommates that I had a big test and going to my room and closing the door and trying to think of the fifth gift. And then once I had these, these five gifts written down on the list in front of me, I thought, well, if these are my gifts, if these are the things that, that were God bestowed on me because I, I wasn't just somehow randomly on this earth, but I was actually put here, if these are the gifts that I was bestowed with, then I don't want to waste them. And wow. therefore, I should look for opportunities and relationships and, and goals in my life that would make the most of these five gifts. And to fast forward at what I can now realize is it caused me to start changing my filter. So I wasn't just going through the day looking at what I didn't do well. I was now going through the day trying to find an opportunity to use at least one of my five gifts that day. And in doing so, I realized that the opportunities were everywhere because, again, these gifts are just an innate part of me. And so I couldn't help but use them or they, they would, I couldn't help but find opportunities to be able to use them. And so it started the balance of not walking around the world so top heavy. And even on a terrible day, even when I thought I'd messed up all over the place, I couldn't deny that I had used at least one of those gifts. Wow. And, and you actually listened to yourself. 
Yeah. I mean, talk about the growth where you actually believed yourself and you had the kindness and compassion to accept it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which, yeah. which just shows a great, incredible inner growth. And you did that by yourself. And that just gives me so much hope for all those people who struggle and don't necessarily put weight on this process or give that process a chance. Do you mind telling us what those five gifts were? <laughs> so, I, so I say in the book that I never do tell anyone what oh, the five okay, gifts yes. are. However, however, the reason for that is not because I wouldn't love to. I would actually love to tell you what my five gifts are. I don't because I'm trying to make the point that when you write down your gifts, it's for you to get to know you. And as soon as you share it with someone, the tilt of their head or something about the way they reacted might make you somehow doubt the experiment. And now that I've proven it to myself, there is no doubting my five gifts. But when you first start doing this, you, you really ought to not share it so that you don't have that happen. But the one gift that I do share is the one that I've already talked about that I knew right away. It was the very first one that I wrote down on that list and, and presented itself quickly. And that was empathy. I knew I had empathy. So as an example, what I would tell you is on a very bad day, if I was noticing everything that I didn't do right, I would in the, in the midst of that horrible day say, wait a second, wait a second, you say you have empathy, show me. <laughs> and, and it really was just like that. It wasn't even so much of a loving, oh, come on, you have empathy, you can do this. It was a, you think you have empathy, fine, show me. And yeah. I, would, I would immediately sort of walk out back into the world looking to find a way to use empathy. And of course, it would show up all over the place. Because again, you can't help but use your gifts and they do show up everywhere. And so I would, I would use my empathy and then I would walk away from an interaction or even a thought that, it, that used empathy. And I would mentally pat myself on the back and say, all right, you know what? You do, you do have empathy. <laughs> and and it, was, it was my way of becoming my best PR person because I uh, you know, a good coach will tell you what you should do, but a good coach will also say, hey, that was really good. And yes. that's what I had shifted to, what I didn't realize. Well, as we come to the end of this podcast, I cannot believe the time has yet just flown by, I guess. I wanted to talk about your last chapter, which is my favorite, and I understand it's yours too. Yeah. And you titled it so appropriately, uh, Wielding Hope. So tell us why you titled it that way. What do you want to, uh, our listeners to think about in, uh, with respect to their destiny, agency, and suffering? And why should we keep the flame always burning no matter how hard the journey might be? I feel like in reflection of my own experiences, but more so in the privilege of getting to sit with people in these difficult times, that the unspoken force that was always in the room was hope. So you wouldn't even have made the appointment if you didn't have some hope that it could get better. And hope to me is simply the possibility of something good. It doesn't even have to be proven in that moment. It's just the possibility of something good. So you wouldn't have shown up in the office if it wasn't the possibility of something good. We wouldn't hold on if there wasn't a possibility of something good. So ultimately, without even realizing it, what was getting us to just take the next step in our own suffering was hope. And the hardest thing to deal with. And for people who, are, who have experienced depression, I think this is the heaviest price of depression, is that it's very, very hard in certain moments to find hope. And people in those moments do not think that there is any hope. And what I would want listeners to know is hope was always there. It can be really, really hard sometimes to remind ourselves or to see it, but it's in the background the entire time. And so the chapter is called Wielding Hope. And the idea of that is if it's always there, as hard as it might be to see it in any given moment, know that it is and know that with effort and sometimes great effort, you can tap into it and not only tap into it, but then actually wield it. Because again, the greatest weapon against fear is hope. And if there are two, big, yeah, if there's two big forces in our life, if one is love and one is fear, then the greatest weapon against fear and the greatest weapon that love allows us is hope, the possibility of something good. So I would tell you that in whatever moment I thought that I had messed up so much or that, I, or that things had happened to me that were clearly showing me that I wasn't good enough, God's grace was that I could find some sense of hope. And sometimes it was the person in my life who told me how much they loved me. Sometimes it was, I got a good grade and I couldn't deny that. And, and I was like, wow, I guess, I guess there's a possibility I might pass this class or, you know, whatever it was in that moment, I, I feel like God, the universe, 
the grace of that force was that it allowed me to have hope even in the worst of times. So I do think it is crucial that we recognize the value of hope so that we can use it purposefully. Wow. You know, what makes me so happy right now is we have had these conversations forever. And every time I'm with you, I feel like I need to take out my notebook or something or recorder. (laughs) Now this is forever captured. And I mean, these beautiful ways that you phrase things and the way you speak and there's genuine compassion and caring and a, a incredible sense of peace and optimism. And nobody will ever say that you work with people who are going through hardship because you look like you, you're walking uh, in a park with them as if it's a, <laughs> it's a sunny day and they are with Subi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And, and, you know, again, life happens and there are times in my life where I'm on the down and there's times where I'm on, on the riding the wave and knowing who you are, knowing that there is hope and knowing that there's always purpose in things isn't a Pollyanna rose covered glasses, false optimism. It's an assurance that despite it all, there is an innate worthiness within me, which I believe is that spark of a divine, that there is reason why things happen and it's up to me to glean from it what I can. And as long as I can understand that there's the possibility of something out there that could be better, then I need to keep going. So I believe that that is really the reason why I can now approach life in a way that I could never have imagined when I was a child or in my 20s. Well, thank you for capturing these brilliant ideas into a book so people can read it. I, I have uh, bought books uh, so that I can give, as you know, I'm on a sabbatical, <laughs> so I don't have a lot of clients that I'm working with, but this has been one of one of my gifts to them, a simple little a manual for life that we don't often get. So thank you for putting this together for us and sharing your brilliant ideas and a thoughtfulness. I think it's going to go a long ways as every listener engages with this. And particularly, I think to me, um, you really demystified this issue of anxiety. I think striving and anxiety uh, go hand in hand. And every day we get up and there is an incredible striving that we somehow are woken up to, but that is not to be uh, considered as a flaw or a a folly. Uh, Some of us may have um, in a greater amount than necessary, (laughs) (laughs) but I really appreciate you taking the time. Any parting wisdoms as we uh, call it, uh, call it a day? Uh, You know, I think you and I have shared so much wisdom today and we will continue to do so in our, our discussions, but I'm sure that the listeners not only get that when they listen to your podcast, But I would encourage, you know, to me, wisdom is knowledge that is gained from living life. And yet, what good is wisdom if you hold on to it? So my last word to to people is share the wisdom. And wisdom doesn't mean I, I know stuff and you don't know stuff. It means this is what I know. Tell me what you know. And I think that in this world of of fast paced um, instant gratification, we don't have enough purposeful reasons or time to sit down and share wisdom. So I would just say to your listeners, share your wisdom, share it with each other, listen to the other and find that wisdom will, in some form or fashion, always give you a moment of insight. Thank you so much, Subi, Dr. B, for being here with us and spreading joy. I really am grateful to you. Thank you so very, very much for all the joy you spread too. All right. That's all the time we have for today. Sadly, wow, Sucheta, unlike you, I did fill a notebook, even though we did record this great conversation. (laughs) You know, I think my favorite is if I can't say it out loud, then I cannot say it in my head. Boy, my life would have unfolded very differently if I had had oh, this guideline a thousand it. years ago. All right, uh, dear audience, I suspect you know someone who will benefit greatly from this conversation, so we would be grateful if you would forward it to them. On behalf of our host, Sucheta Kamath, today's guest, Dr. Subrat Bargave, or affectionately known as Dr. B, and all of us at Cerebral Matters, thanks for listening today, and we look forward to seeing you again right here next week on Full Prefront. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive functions. To contact our host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive functions, visit her website at CerebralMatters.com. That's CerebralMatters.com. Tune in next week for the next informative episode of Full Prefrontal. Prefrontal.